We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. All right, welcome back, folks, and uh, we are back to talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is climate change, environmentalism, and what to do about it. Uh, what does rational environmentalism look like, as opposed to, let's say, radical environmentalism? And every couple of years, the uh, the UN comes out with a report. They call that report the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. And every time they do this, uh, the media calls it a code red, says, look, this is exactly what we're talking about. Look at the scientific consensus. We're all going to die. It's all a catastrophe. Uh, everybody should be worried. Uh, stop driving your car immediately Buy a solar panel and um, or I don't know, just uh, and stop doing everything. Uh, and Green New Deal. OK, just a lot of uh, hair on fire exclamations. And uh, I want to talk about what the truth is behind this report Uh, Does it really say the things that the media claims it says? And uh, we've gone through it, of course, on on my committee on energy and commerce. Uh, We we had a a quick briefing on this, and that briefing was filled with supposed experts who really could not stop talking about the catastrophe that awaited us. Uh, Everything is worse uh, than it possibly than it ever could have been before. And uh, it's only going to get worse if we don't take uh, immense action right away. Um, Cost and benefit analysis, be damned. Uh, One person who's been really great on this subject and uh, has been on this podcast before is uh, Bjorn Lomberg from the Copenhagen Consensus Center and uh, is an expert on this subject and is going to help us unpack this report. Bjorn, thanks so much for being on. Hey Dan, it's great to be back. So this is oh, this is your third time on. I think uh, really appreciate it. Look, you, you've written a lot of great books on this: "The Skeptical Environmentalist," "Cool It," "How to Spend Seventy Five Billion Dollars to Make the World a Better Place," uh, "The Nobel Laureate's Guide to the Smartest Targets for the World 2016, 2030, and "Prioritizing Development: A Cost Benefit Analysis of the UN's SDGs." So, I think I think one of the main themes of your work is okay, everybody, calm down. This is real. We're not saying it's not real, but what do the numbers actually say? What does the science actually say? And now let's do a cost-benefit analysis about what we actually do about that. Uh, and, and for some reason, that's like heresy to what what is increasingly the mainstream, um, even the scientific community. Maybe, maybe you have a different opinion on that. Uh, but but certainly the political community and certainly the international political community, the, 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 the kind of folks at the U.N., and then, of course, our mainstream media. Um, the IPCC recently came out with this report. Okay, they, they call it AR6, the Physical Science Basis. After it was published, the Secretary General of the UN summarized the report as a code red for humanity. Others went so far as calling the Western world guilty of climate crimes. So, I mean, let's, let's just start from the beginning. Um, your, your general take, and then we can get into some more specifics. Does it really show that there's a code red for humanity? What what was your what's your initial reading of the report? Yeah. So, first things first, uh, it's it's actually a pretty damn good report. It's a very very long report. It's almost four thousand pages uh, long, and I I was called up immediately after it came out and said, "Can you go on the radio? Can you go on TV and talk about it?" And I was like, "I actually need to read this. I don't know how other people do this, uh, but yeah, you know, I I haven't read all of it, but I've certainly read very large parts of it." And most of the science is actually pretty good, but it in no way supports what the UN Secretary General uh, calls a code red. It doesn't talk at all about that. Actually, if you want to get all technical about it, this report doesn't even tell us about the impacts for humanity. That's what the second and third part of the report that will be published later this year and uh, next year. Uh, So it's not in that report. But of course, the report in that way didn't really matter. Nobody actually read the report. Uh, They simply wanted to say, the UN climate panel has once again pointed out that global warming is real. Hey, we knew that. We've known that for decades. And that it's a man-made problem. We knew that, and that's absolutely true. 
and therefore it's a catastrophe. No, you can't make that connection. And that's not what they're telling us. They go carefully through all the different things that are likely to happen. And some things are getting worse. Other things are getting better. And we need to hear both of those points. And we need to have a calm conversation. Instead of, of course, saying, let's dismantle the entire Western civilization as we've uh, grown uh, since the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago and everything that's made us rich and do something else. Before you, you know, do that, maybe you want to just be calm and listen to what the science says. Yeah, and, and the science is complicated. It's, um, it's, it's wrought with uh, likely scenarios, most dangerous scenarios, unlikely scenarios, the, the, the whole nine yards. It really seems to me like... Um, like our media chooses the worst case scenarios and, and runs with that as if that's as if that's expected. But I, I think a reasonable scientist would say, well, it, it's, it's pretty hard to expect that. W one question I have, too, is it, how, how different is it from the 2018 report? Um, it, it's slightly different in, in the sense that the uh, 2018 report was actually a a. a, 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 a a commandeered report. It was something that the climate community, uh, if you remember back in Paris in 2015, uh, the uh, politicians decided we're going to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is by any reasonable estimate impossible to do. Uh, and then they said, given that we've come up with this very round and arbitrary number, can you make us a report that shows that this is a good choice? That was what the 2018 report was. And they basically told it, told uh, uh, the politicians, look, uh, any number that's lower is better from a climate perspective. Of course, not from an economic perspective, right. but from a climate perspective, uh, you probably can't do that. But if you want to, you have to change the entire world and really, really fast. That's where AOC got her, her we only have 12 years left. Um, so the current report is actually better because it's not trying to uh, uh, answer a politically uh, 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 commandeered question, but it's simply trying to tell us what's up with climate change. And in that way, it tells us pretty much what all the other reports have told us, namely that global warming is real, it's man-made, it is a problem, but it's not the end of the world. Let me let me give you an example, because you, you mentioned that there, you know, the, the science is fraught and there's all these worst case scenarios and and uncertainty and all that. And that's absolutely true. And and we also need that conversation and we don't have that conversation in the media. But I actually think in some way it's much, much simpler. So let me just give you one example. So the U.N. starts out with saying, what are the big things that happen when global warming uh, happens? Two of the main things that we know is happening, because temperatures are rising, we are seeing more heat waves and fewer cold waves. Now, both of those things are sort of obvious. If temperatures rise, you would see more heat waves. You'd also see fewer cold waves. Notice how you only heard the first part in the media coverage. That's your first warning signal. But the second thing is, well, how big of an impact is this? Well, it turns out, that a new Lancet paper, so in the very esteemed uh, Lancet journal, uh, came out about a month ago. So way too new to actually make it into the uh, UN Climate Panel report. But they looked at what has been the impact of global warming in this century, so the last 20 years. So over the last 20 years, temperatures have risen. So we've seen more heat waves. We've seen fewer cold waves. How many extra people have that killed? And they actually looked at that. So they found that over the last 20 years, global warming has increased the number of heat waves so that 116,000 more people die every year from, uh, from, uh, from heat. That's definitely a problem. That's something we should be aware of. But what they also found was that every year, because of increasing temperatures, we see fewer cold waves and because many, many more people around the world die from cold than from heat, it's actually reduced cold deaths by 283,000 people. So if you do the math, and it's really very simple, the overall impact is that every year, because of global warming, 166,000 fewer people die. You never heard that. Right. And I think this is a fundamental point. It's, it's, you know, there's lots of uncertainty and all this stuff, but really on the core outcome, temperatures rise, so you're gonna see more heat waves, fewer cold waves. 
We only hear more heat waves, which is absolutely true, but we don't hear about fewer cold waves. We only hear that more people are going to die from uh, heat waves. We don't hear that fewer people are going to die from fewer cold waves. Right. And it, it matters because many fewer people are at more, many more people are saved by temperature rises than are sacrificed by temperature rises. We need to know this. I, I'm, I'm even, and even then, I'm still skeptical of, of numbers that say 100,000 people have died of heat waves. I mean, you, you die because you don't have air conditioning. Are you really dying because it's a few more degrees hotter than it was yesterday, even if that's a record yep. temp? You know, that's. I wish people would kind of take a step back and think, what exactly is happening here? How are you measuring the, the these deaths? And and because there was an interesting sort of debunking report that I think Oren Cass did a while back when it, about the cl- costs of climate change. And it turns out that the yep. majority of the costs are human death. And he looks yep. into this and he's like, how are you, fi- how are you coming up with these numbers? Yep. And basically, you know, to, to simplify it for people, and I've said this many times in the podcast, but here we go again. To simplify this, this report for people, you would, you would basically have to assume the following, that in 100 years, if Philadelphia finally reaches the temperatures that Houston has now in current times, then Philadelphia heat deaths are going to increase by like 50 times. Now, is that reason? Is that a reasonable assumption that just because yeah, Philadelphia gets, any air <laughs> yeah, they're just, they're just all going to be just, ah, it's like, you know, like these, these apocalyptic movies. I mean, give me a break. No, they're just going to turn on more AC. People die because they don't have AC or heat. That's why they die. Yeah. Um, it, it's yeah. not because the temperature is like a few degrees warmer or colder than it was, you know, yesterday, uh, which is, which is what a wave is, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a quick jump, but it's not like you're in an oven. <laughs> it's, it's, no. it's, it's not so, like you're so cooking. Dan, just, just to give a, a context than this, uh, because it's much easier to, uh, uh, to measure now, uh, uh rather than what's going to happen, you know, in 80 years in sort of a hypothetical, uh, and, and most people don't die because it's extremely warm or extremely cold. They die a little more because it gets colder or a little more because it gets warmer. You die more from heat simply because you are a little more likely to get heart attacks. And because everyone gets them, you just need a little change. That's really what drives us. In the same way with cold deaths, especially for older people, you restrict your uh, your arteries to, to keep your inner uh, core body warm, and that means you increase your heart uh, 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 blood pressure, and that makes it more likely that you get heart attacks. That's really what drives us. So, so most both heat deaths and especially cold deaths don't happen on the incredibly frosty days or in the incredibly hot days, but they simply happen more when you're off the optimal temperature, which surprisingly to most people is in the upper range of where you normally is. So yeah. I would imagine in Houston, it might be you know, in the 70s or the 80s. Uh, uh, so, so it really is a question of saying, if you're away from your optimal temperature, you will likely have a slightly higher risk of dying. But again, if we care about people, it's not about the spectacular heat deaths or indeed the spectacular cold deaths, but it's the fact that many more people die from cold than from heat. And therefore, we should actually say when you see more extreme weather with heat deaths, but fewer, less extreme weather with cold deaths, we should all in all rejoice because it's actually working out in our favor as of now. And that's a great point. Um it's similar to the point about the greening of the earth. Uh, is, yeah. it, it, did I read that right? That the, the, the size of land double the size of Australia has been basically become more green uh, yes. because of warmer temperatures or, 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 so, or not so, just warmer temperatures, but more plant food, which is CO2. Yes. CO2 is a, is a plant fertilizer. Again, this is absolutely uncontroversial. And, and again, you typically only hear bad stuff happening from climate change. And of course, that's a cartoon version of, of climate change. Climate change will have negative and positive impacts. They're going to be more negative than the positive. That's why it's a problem. But to simply ignore the positive is not a good way to inform people. Neither is a good way to end up spending trillions of dollars. So uh, gr- global greening is something that we can see almost everywhere on the planet over the last 30 years because we pumped out lots of CO2. It simply means we put out more plant food, which means that there's more green on the planet. Now, the researchers actually look at this as area of leaves. Uh, So they actually, and don't ask me exactly how they do that, they measure all the trillions of leaves and the area of those leaves. They do that with satellite. Uh, And what they can show is that over the last 30 years, we've actually gotten, and, and we used to say two, now it's almost three, three 
continents the size of Australia or three continents the size of the continental U.S., the lower 48 states, mm -hmm. of more green leaves over the last 30 years because of global warming. Again, this does not mean that they're not also problems with global warming, but right. everything else equal, everyone should be rejoicing for the fact that we've gotten a lot more green on the planet. Does that, this is kind of a layman's question for, for the scientific community, does anybody study um, this, this sort of feedback effects? I mean, does, is there an equilibrium that becomes reached because as more CO2 gets pumped into the air, you get more green, you get more plants, which obviously suck in CO2. They're the ultimate CO2 scrubbers on planet Earth. Um, does, does that ever lead to, a, to an equilibrium or do we need to be planting a lot more trees? And, and is that even a reasonable suggestion? That's something, you know, Republicans have suggested, the Trillion Tree Project, for instance. Um, is, that, is that a reasonable way to go? Yeah. So, so they do suck up more CO2. It's not very much in the total uh, uh, scheme of things. And yes, they have calculated that. So, you know, uh, roughly speaking, uh, mankind puts out about 35 gigatons of uh, billion tons of CO2, and half of it is soaked up, and half of that in the ocean, half of that in leaves, basically. And so it does soak up a little more, but it doesn't do more than that. And it's really just for one year. So this is not what's going to drive it. I know that a lot of people are saying, oh, let's just plant lots and lots of trees. Uh, and, and look, there's nothing wrong with planting trees, but let's be realistic. This is not how you're going to solve this problem. Uh, basically, because we need land for a lot of things, mostly for nature and for food. And planting a lot of trees just to feel good about yourself may very well end up making food prices go up and making nature have less space both of which is probably undesirable. So no, this can be a little bit of the, the solution and we should certainly love having trees where we like them, but don't think that this is the primary solution. Yeah, you're saying it, it, it's it's like every solution that you and I have talked about, okay? Let's let, let's take a measured look at it. Um, yeah. Don't 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 plow down of acres and acres of farmland just to build trees uh, or just to plant trees when in fact there might be better ways to do it, which is fair enough. Um, but now that granted, you know, a trillion trees, I don't know where they come up with that number. I think it just sounds good. It uh, sounds good. Like <laughs> many other numbers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, you you could, you know, you, you look around any given city and you're like, I could fit like 16 trees over there. Why don't we just plant them? I mean, it's sure. Why not? Um, but you know, it's, I, it's, I it's one, I can just, so it's a great idea to plant trees in cities because cities are the place where the world is hottest, mostly because there's lots of asphalt, lots of dark surfaces, little water features. If you plant trees, it becomes cooler and it becomes a nicer place to live. And it actually also is likely to reduce the uh, the temperatures uh, over over reasonable periods. So it's a very simple way to both make people happy and, and cool the essential parts of the planet, along with making, for instance, uh, uh, rooftops or, or, or even just uh, asphalt surfaces uh, more uh, white and hence make them more reflective and make them less hot. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the little things can make a huge difference and they come at a low cost and yes. also make cities look nice. Um, that's for sure. So it, it, maybe let's go back. Let's take let's go back up to the 30,000 foot level. As, as, as this is, you know, this entire conversation is about narratives, it seems. And that's why I framed it in the beginning as rational environmentalism versus radical environmentalism. And, you know, it, it, and I think that both sides are coming to the conclusion that look, climate change is real. There's a cost to it. But what is it? But what, what one side asks, which would, I guess, be my side, let's call it the political right, because unfortunately, just everything in Every discussion falls along those lines, whether it's COVID or the environment. It always falls along the, the, these political right and left lines. And the political left, it's, well, yeah, there's not only is there a problem, but it's a catastrophe. Not only is it a catastrophe, but it's right around the corner. Um, it's a swift, it's a swift catastrophe. Um, but the IPCC report doesn't really say that. Um, what, what? What are some of the effects it does lay out? And you said there's more reports coming out in the next in the next year, um, but those reports have come out come out in the past uh, from from previous reports. So, you know what what are some of the basic numbers that we should keep in mind when about the cost of climate change according to the scientific consensus? Yeah. So so again, the UN tells us that we're going to see more heat waves, as we talked about, fewer cold waves. They tell us we're going to see more sea level rise 
And that's a significant challenge. But again, one we have eminently shown that we know how to tackle. Over a century, we know how to handle uh, sea level rises of one to three feet. Uh, this is, you know, Holland obviously is a, is a, a prime uh, a, a proponent of that, but it's something that almost everyone knows how to do and fairly cheaply. Too. And, and board on, on that subject, and we're going to go on, on a tangent, but it's a worthy tangent. Is there the real question is, can you prevent one to three uh, feet of sea level rising? Yeah. Can you prevent so, it? So, no, no. You can, so you can do very little, even if, you know, even if the U.S. and uh, all the rich world uh, cut their carbon emissions uh, down to zero tomorrow, it would have a fairly small impact on where. Uh, sea level rise would be in 2100. It would have a bigger impact uh, in the coming, uh, in the following centuries. But again, uh, it starts to become a little silly to start thinking about planning sensibly into the 23rd or 24th century. Uh, the second bit is that it's very, very cheap to tackle. Now, people think, you know, if, if it was an onslaught of three feet of sea level rise tomorrow, uh, you know, it'd all be Kevin Costner and Waterworld kind of thing. Uh, but the reality is, if this happens over 80 years, we know how to tackle this. And actually, studies show we're going to safeguard virtually all land that's valuable, that has humans, or that have things that we want to preserve. So we are going to tackle this. And, you know, again, Louisiana is a great example. You just had a Hurricane 4 hit uh, Louisiana, and most of the sea defenses held because we know how to do this. Now, Obviously, it would have been nice that we had already thought about doing this in, in 2005. And there's a whole learning period. Remember, in Holland, uh, they also had huge floods back in 1954. And that was what set them on the path to the country that they are today, where they've actually you know, safeguarded pretty much all of Holland and know how to do that for the next uh, couple of centuries. So this is going to happen at very low cost. So when you predict this catastrophe, no, you're predicting it if you assume nobody does anything. But of course, with any realistic outcome, you will see much less impact in the future. So just to give you one number, uh, right now we estimate uh, that about one and a half million people are in, impacted by global flooding every year. Just 20 years ago, that was three million people. And part of the reason we've stopped having three million people being impacted and only one and a half is because we're much richer, we're much more resilient. Towards the end of the century, because we're richer, because we're better able to tackle this, we'll be down to perhaps 10 or 15,000 people being impacted every year. We are on the right track and global warming make a slight change in that track. That is, it makes better slightly slower. That's a problem, but that's of course not what you're told. You're told it's the end of the world. But that only comes if you assume nobody's going to do anything. I mean, their, their, their common phrase is the world is on fire. I mean, that, 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 that's, been the, that's been the new catchphrase for a while now. And, and this gets into other questions. And they're really tricky with this stuff. Like I said, we just had a hearing on, well, it wasn't a hearing. It was a briefing uh, with some experts. And they're very tricky. And you've got to listen very carefully to what they say to understand their trickery on these things. Um, you know, for instance, and maybe you can shed more light on this because I, I, I do not have these, these, these facts built into my head the way you do. Um, but on the sea level rising one, like, look, our sea levels rising? Yes. Have they been for a long time? Yes. Are they accelerating? Uh, it, it appears to me, yes. Uh, the question is how much and how, and how much they'll keep accelerating. Is this an exponential acceleration or is this a slight... <clears throat> And but what they what they do is they often cite um, a specific year and they say like since 1960 or 70. Do you shed light on that? Why why do they always choose that year with respect to, to sea levels rising? Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I certainly do. I'm not sure I know about this for sea level rises, but they certainly do. For instance, for hurricanes, yeah. uh, because hurricanes maybe that's what I'm talking uh, about. Were at a global low in the uh, around the 1970s. And so it's very, very easy to say, oh, since the 1970s, everything has gotten worse. Well, yes, but that's also because we have very good evidence that the 70s and a little bit of the 60s, a little bit of the 80s were a global low for the last 200 years or so. So most of the 20th century was high hurricane season. Then the 70s came around. And of course, that was right when satellites started. So this is not unnecessarily trickery. But it's certainly a, a, an unwillingness to say, but if we actually look 
before, and we we know that very, very well for the Atlantic and for the U.S., there is not an increase in, for instance, landfalling hurricanes for the U.S. There's actually a slight decrease. It's insignificant, but it's not an increase. And likewise, for strong hurricanes, that is, you know, uh, category three and higher, they're declining slightly, not increasing. And when you're being told these stories, there's two things you need to look out for. One is what you just talked about. If you just pick a specific time period, and this is very, very much yeah. cherry picking when you do that for, for, for hurricanes. But the second part is you also got to ask how much of an impact will this have? And of course, the truth is, if you're a poor nation or if you're a poor community, the impact of any given hurricane is going to be much, much more devastating because you don't have the resilience. And so the reality here is to say, if you want to help people in the future, do you want to help them through climate policy? That is, make sure you have slightly less higher temperatures by the end of the century. Or do you want to help them by getting out of poverty? Because if they get out of poverty, they're not only more resilient to hurricanes and many, many other things, but they're also more resilient towards hunger and lack of education and their kids dying from easily curable infectious diseases and all these other things that also matter. So again, the point here is not just to recite what impacts us, but how much can we change of that with social factors? And the answer is we can change a lot if we make ourselves richer. We can change very, very little if we just focus on cutting carbon emissions. That's why I think it's, you know, in, in so many ways, there, there's something wrong when people see a hurricane hit uh, a, a city or a fire hit somewhere and say, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to drive my SUV tomorrow. That's, that's like the least impactful thing you can do that will have a marginal impact in 100 years instead of actually helping these people to become resilient in so many different ways. You mentioned fire. Let me just uh, uh, say that. Yes, they say there's more going to be more fire weather, which is uh, one of these other tricky things. It simply means it's more likely that if all of the things were equal, there'd be more fire. Yeah, it's going to be drier. It's going to be higher temperature, which is true uh, for many things from global warming. But actually, we also have data for how much fire there is in the world. And fire has been going down for the last uh, uh, 12 decades. So from uh, 1900 till today, both for the uh, uh, registered period. So the one that we have uh, reasonable data for and certainly for the satellite uh, era uh, where we have accurate data uh, for the entire world. It's very contrary to what you think. So what happens is fire weather goes up, but because we're much better able to avoid fire, because we're smart and resilient species, we see less and less fire. Now, again, this doesn't mean that there's not a good argument in saying we should make sure that global warming doesn't overwhelm our fire abilities. Uh, one of the ways, obviously, is by, uh, 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 um, what is it they call it now, predict preventive burns they yeah, there's another forest report. management just just general yeah, forest basically, management basically where forest you're, you're clearing underbrush you, and doing yeah preventive yes, that maintenance you, that you stop having enormous buildup of of, of of fuels that means you get uh fires that basically run out of uh, of control well, when it comes to forest management ironically one of the main problems is this desire to keep nature pristine you yes. know and don't touch it don't touch it don't look at it don't don't walk in there don't do anything because that's nature and there's some like beautiful and, and thing there because and it's very romantic but it also it's bad for the forest because that's how it gets burned <laughs> yes there's there's also a lot of rich people who don't want these controlled fires because that means air pollution and they don't want that so instead they get a catastrophic fire that burned down their house right. uh yeah so so the reality is here we're smart and we know how to deal with most of these issues again it doesn't mean that global warming is not a problem it doesn't mean that we can't do something about global warming but there's a huge difference from saying what the un climate panel tells us this is a problem so let's find a solution that costs less and solve most of the problem to saying this is the end of the world. So let's throw everything in the kitchen sink at it, which is a bad policy. Plus, of course, it's actually not going to happen because nobody will reelect uh, uh, political leaders that will confer you with tens of thousands of dollars of climate costs. So, it, you know, another number you point out often is, is the, according to the data, we, we assume that our, our global GDP will increase, which is, you know, an indication of well-being, let's say, and 
reduction in poverty. So our global GDP will increase by 450% by the year 2100. With the cost of climate change, we might expect that to only be 434% increase in global GDP. So that's still pretty damn good. Um, And so, again, it begs the question, okay, well, that is a cost. It is a cost, uh, undeniable a cost, but it's certainly not the cost of, you know, the world being on fire, right? And it's mm. it's not this exaggerated cost that we're talking about. And if we're going to try and mitigate that cost, we certainly want to wouldn't want to pay more money than we're going to lose. That wouldn't make yes. any sense. It's just not how you would invest in anything. Um, but there's but there's just but unfortunately there's just a very emotional argument. And the other thing that strikes me about the the radical environmentalists is is they're they're they have non-falsifiable arguments, meaning they can never be wrong. No matter what the data shows, it shows that they're right. If it's too cold, it's because they're right. If there's a rainstorm, it's because they're right. Everything that happens, they can, they can, they can, they can finagle their way into saying that they're, that, that this just proves my point. And that's, that's a really good sign for people that somebody is probably lying to you or at least being somewhat dishonest when nothing you can say can can falsify their arguments. It's 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 a tricky it's a tricky little game yeah, to play. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a good point at least to 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 emphasize. And, and you know, look, I, I I try to get people to uh, pay attention to data and facts. Uh, so I actually think it does have an impact. Uh, and when you point out to people, well, the data only shows this part. You know, it tells you that there's going to be fewer cold waves. You can't just say you know like uh, 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 Secretary Kerry did in uh, in February when you had that huge uh, you know, uh, snowstorm in, in Texas. Uh, you can't just say, oh, global warming. No, all models, not just most models, not just most of the time, all models show that you get less cold. I mean, there's a reason why it's called global warming. You can't just make this up. It doesn't mean that you don't get more heat waves. That's true. Go with that. But you can't say, oh, and the cold wave was also because of global warming. And I think you lose people and you lose trust and you lose people's willingness to listen to you when you engage in this sort of trigger and just say everything is because of global warming. That's why it's important to get the data back and say, look, what is actually happening here and how big of a problem is it? And I think you're absolutely right to say fundamentally the world is going to be a much better place by the end of the century. People often think, oh, GDP, especially if you're rich, you're so like, oh, but money is not everything. Well, let's just remember it's a lot of people who live on a dollar a day or something. Money is a lot of new opportunities and, uh, and ways to avoid you know, just terrible tragedies. But the fundamental thing is we know that when you're better off, you just simply have better outcomes on pretty much all your parameters. You have fewer kids, you have better health, uh, you have better education, your kids die less, you have more healthy choices, you have more opportunities. There's so many things that we associate with better outcomes from uh, a higher GDP. So fundamentally, when we are much richer by the end of the century, and the UN expects us in all scenarios, we're much better off, there's gonna be a lot less poverty, People are going to be living much longer. They're going to be educated much more. Global warming is not, this is all going to end and we're all going to you know, go into some sort of uh, 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 dystopian future. Global warming means that we will achieve all of those goals slightly later. That's still a problem, but it's not the reason why you should throw everything else overboard and just do global warming. Uh, I want to go over a couple things you know, that, that people hear a lot and maybe would like to know how to respond to. And, and, and again, I'll, I'll bring up the, some of the comments I heard from my own briefing in, in Congress. And, and, and the comments went something like this. Everything is worse than thousands of years ago, um, whether it's heat waves or droughts or flooding or extreme weather. Everything is worse than thousands of years ago. The, the acceleration in sea rise, worse than thousands of years ago. But again, is that a telltale? Because does... If we're talking about man-made global warming, and we can only be talking about man-made global warming because if it's man-made, that means there's, in theory, something we can do about it. But if it's not man-made, then there actually is nothing we can do about it except to adapt. So is it really reasonable to be talking about thousands of years ago, or is it only really reasonable to be talking about co- comparisons to you know, about 100 years ago when, when, when maybe... The, the first there was the first indications that more CO2 emissions might actually start mm. to affect the climate. 
So it, it's obvious that you can only really talk about, uh, you know, the CO2 emissions that we've had have only really been going on for the last hundred years or less. So it doesn't make sense to talk about thousands of years, except for very odd sort of comparisons. There sometimes it might make sense. But I think the, the crucial bit is when people say everything is worse. That's just simply untrue. And I, I think the right thing to say is, oh, so it's worse that we have a lot fewer cold waves that kill the most people in the world. Yeah, you know, cold waves or cold kills Sorry, about 4.5 million people every year. That's almost 10% of everyone who dies every year on the planet. How the hell is that not a good thing that that doesn't occur quite as much? And 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 I, it's not that I'm asking them to sort of admit that everything is good or that most things are good. That's probably not true. Global warming overall has more bad than good. But it's simply to say, when you only say bad things are happening, you're not being honest. And of course, also when you say, and this is another favorite trope, everything is worse than we thought. Well, that almost by definition means that you weren't very good at thinking just before you said this, were you? Because apparently you've been surprised by data. The reality is, and this was also one third thing we, we talked about, when you read this report, it's just like most of the other reports. We've known most of this stuff pretty well for the last 20, 30 years. And it's not surprising because lots and lots of smart people have been working on this for a very long time. We are not dramatically surprised about uh, most things. There are a few things and that's fair, but when you say everything is worse than we thought, that's just false. And when you say everything is, is bad, that's also just false. Yeah, and global greening, good example, cooling, uh, another good example. Yeah, it, 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 of course my question is, <clears throat> It's and this gets very specific and technical, which is again they 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 they, they just they, they they always they always like they, they always talk talk, talk about um, being worse in general terms, but then when you actually unpack the data, you find out things like well actually it might hurricanes might be more extreme by about five percent, but their but their but their frequency decreases by twenty five percent. And then it's like, yeah, so technically you're right. Hurricanes are getting worse, but it's, it's not even a noticeable amount, you know, and, and there's, you know, to, to, to somebody who's not prepared for a hurricane, uh, it doesn't matter if the hurricane's 5% stronger or 5% weaker. It's, it's, it's still a freaking hurricane. And uh, I, I feel like they also, they also make this, they, they make these arguments as if we never had extreme weather in the past. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very strange thing to say <laughs> to, to be honest uh but but that is sort of where they appear to be coming from and then the last thing i would say is that, that people would like to know how to respond to maybe you can address this is you know somebody like aoc is saying look see look at the subways flooded in new york you think climate change isn't happening now and you think we don't need a green new deal now because every weather event again proves their point no matter what the weather event is if it's the if it's the the polar vortex in texas it's it's global warming if it's if it's a heat yeah. wave in and, texas and it's absurd. global warming and, and the absurd thing is everything was worse in the past. Again, not because of global warming, but simply because you were a lot less rich. Remember, what was the biggest natural disaster in the U.S.? That was the Galveston hurricane in 1900 because nobody knew it was coming and it flooded the whole city and it killed about 8,000 people. That is a real disaster. That had nothing to do with global warming. It had everything to do with the fact that you were poor and had very little resilience. That's why we're much better off. Uh, look, uh, these these uh, 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 subways have flooded all the time. There's great data that shows that we've seen these floodings both in New York, in New Jersey, in most of the country. Uh, remember the Mississippi famously flooded for more than 100 days in 1913, uh, created an enormous amount of cost for the U.S. It actually cost 2.5% of the U.S. GDP that year. Jeez. Now... Floodings every year cost in the order of 0.05% every year. It's gone down by 10 times because we're much more resilient. And so there is there's a recency factor that goes on. But I just saw this on TV. And yes, you didn't see uh, the, uh, the Mississippi flood in 19, uh, 1913 because you weren't even around. But it doesn't mean it didn't happen. And we're badly, in, uh, we're badly uh, informed. 
if we don't actually hear this. Now, had this been about other things where there was a strong interest in actually making sure the narrative was clean and true, of course, this would be the job of media to come in and say, yes, but actually it was much worse in the past. Many more people, so you know, about three times more people used to die from flooding around the US. We've gotten a lot better at not having people die from flooding, from not from dying from hurricanes, not getting terrible impacts from, from hurricanes or flooding and many other things. We've actually seen this across the world. So when people tell you everything is worse, it's because they're looking at a very specific factor, very specifically, and without looking at what will happen for, for human resilience. In truth, the world is much better. And it's just, you know, it doesn't pass the smell test. Where, when would you rather live? Would these people seriously rather live in 1900? Of course they wouldn't. It, it, and is it reasonable to say, okay, so we have a hurricane that, that just made landfall in Louisiana. It, you know, there was, it was a big hurricane. Is it reasonable to say, um, and, and of course they often say it, that you know, this wouldn't have happened without man-made climate change, or that it would have been about half as bad without man-made climate change? Can any can any reasonable scientist actually say something like that? So, so they are making an argument that you can say this. I think it's a fundamentally flawed argument, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because what they do is they say. Let's run the climate models with and without CO2 in the atmosphere and show that, you know, for instance, it's hotter over uh, the uh, 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 the uh, uh, Caribbean, uh, over the Caribbean, uh, and, and that's why it blew into a Category 4. You can do that and actually show that, see, it would only have been a Category 3 had we not had, you know, global warming. But... Why is it then that we can't see this overall? That's, of course, because they don't look at all the hurricanes that didn't happen because there's too much. For instance, wind shear is one of the things that prevent uh, 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 hurricanes from happening. And we also know that becomes stronger because of, of global warming. So fundamentally, the reason why we see declining numbers of hurricanes hitting the U.S. is a very good indicator that currently – we are not seeing the impact of global warming. When you then say, ah, but I can run a specific model and show it here, you've got to ask, and this is the simple question, why the hell can't you then see this overall? And in, in, in the data of, of the real world as opposed yes. to modeling. And the other question I always have is, okay, I understand that you're saying higher temperatures uh, might produce a, a stronger hurricane. But then let's ask the question, have the temperatures are the temperatures we're seeing this summer in the Caribbean, are they, have they never been matched before in history? Because I'm pretty sure that those temperatures have been matched before, let's say, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. So unless that's wildly different now, I'm not really sure how that modeling argument makes any sense. So, so I, I think that's that's probably not a winning argument. Uh, I mean, okay. overall, we have good evidence that temperatures have risen. Uh, and it's not a question of saying, you know, if it only happened once uh, a, a year back in 1800, but it now happens 30 times a year, it's more likely that you get a hurricane. The, the point is a hurricane doesn't just come from hot water, which is what most people would like you to believe. Because if it was just hot water, sure, more hot water, more hurricanes. But that's not what happens because hurricanes are inhibited mostly because of wind shear. So the wind going in different directions and different layers, which basically makes it impossible to sustain the, the hurricane, which is probably the main reason why, despite that we see hotter water, we don't see more. We actually see slightly fewer hurricanes hitting the U.S. And so, again, it goes down to saying, so you're going to tell me you'd rather trust your model, which tells you that there is more hurricane rather than looking at the data that tells you there's less. And I think it's obvious to, at least to me, which one ought to win out. Yeah. Um, it, let's finish this up by talking about the, um, the, the cost of solutions um, and, and reasonable solutions and reasonable approaches to, you know, looking at the year 2100. And so, you know, for instance, worst case scenario, the IPCC lays out, we go through a business as usual warming to three degrees Celsius. And, and just to clarify for everybody, that's three degrees warmer than like the early 1900s, right? Yeah. Okay. And we've already warmed about 1.5. One degree. Yeah, one degree. Yeah, okay, one. we've warmed about one degree Celsius. So this would be an additional two degrees. Um, and in that worst case scenario, what what, what do they say happens? Um, what, and, and, and I guess more importantly, what would have to happen for us to prevent it? 
So again, I think it's a sort of recap of what we talked about before. Uh, for instance, they'll say there's going to be fewer but stronger hurricanes, so we'll have slightly more damage. But remember, because we're much richer and much more resilient, we'll actually have less damage, but we'll have slightly more or less damage than we otherwise would have <laughs> Slightly had. more so, or less damage. Uh, so That's a great it, way to put know, it. Simple. Right now, hurricanes globally cost about 0.04% of, of the global GDP every year. Because of global warming, it will only decline to 0.02% by the end of the century. Had we had no global warming, it would have declined all the way down to 0.01. So yeah, it's worse because it could have been even better, but it's still a lot better. We're still gonna be impacted a lot less. Uh, likewise with fire, so the EPA has actually done an estimate. If you do all the things that people are talking about with climate change, you will see slightly less fire by the end of the century. So you will see the fire that we used to see in the early part of the 2000s instead of the fire that we used to see in the 2010s. Mm. Uh, yes, that's a problem. No, that's not the end of the world. And again, it tells you we need to get a sense of proportion. The other part of this conversation, and, and this is just a new finding, I don't know if you saw this, but... Um, so Nature just published a study of what will it cost to do Biden's policies. They didn't brand it as that, and nobody's actually picked up on that. But they, they sort of explicitly say, what will it cost to go net zero by 2050? They don't actually say that because net zero is 100% reduction. They only look at 95% reduction. So it's a little less than what Biden is promising. They find that the cost in 2050 every year is gonna be more than $11,000 per person in the United States. So a family of four will have to pay $44,000 every year for these policies. Now, I challenge you to believe that that will ever, ever happen. Of course it's not. This, this sort of shows that we're trying to solve a medium scale problem with policies that are gonna be more costly than Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security Times two. Yeah. How, how, what? That's it, just ridiculous. Quoting you, uh, talking about this subject, you say each dollar spent on the Paris Climate Accord uh, would likely produce climate benefits worth 11 cents. It's, yeah. not, it's not a good return. It's, not a good, no, uh, it's return. not a good solution. Again, it's not that all these people are not well-intentioned. I think they're really, you know, they say, here's a problem, let's try to fix it. But trying to fix it by making... Ordinary people pay large sums of money to do a little bit of environmental good in 100 years is not the right way to go about it for two reasons, partly because it's economically stupid, but also because it will actually lead to wide scale political protest. You know, way before politicians and remember, there's going to be what, five or six presidents, at least after Biden uh, up to 2050, uh, you know, Way before you get to a point where you have to pay $11,000 per person, you will have voted that guy or gal out of office. And you will have picked someone who will likely say, stuff that, we're not going to do anything at all. So in, in uh, the likely outcome is that you're actually going to make it harder to do the smart stuff. And the smart stuff, again, is the ways that you can cut carbon emissions at low cost. We know that if you could if you could uh, you know, drive renewable energy or other green sources way down, and renew renewables, for instance, together with batteries, if you could drive the price of that down dramatically, everyone would buy it, not just right. rich, well-meaning Americans in, in California, but also the Chinese and the Indians. The reason why they don't do it is because, you know, not surprisingly, yes, yeah, solar is great in, when it's sunny, but the rest of the time it's really, really crappy. And likewise with wind, you know, it's not that you can't use it somewhat and you can actually. Yeah. There's, there's, there's places and there's places and times for yeah. renewables, but. But you're not going to cover 100 percent or anywhere close. And when you try to get near that, you're going to get those enormous costs as what the nature and, studied. And as on. um as uh, uh, Schellenberger just pointed out on a tweet thread that I retweeted, you, know, you got Gavin Newsom um, shutting down Diablo Canyon nuclear facility in California. And, I, and, and he says that the, the reason is, is because the environmentalists say, well, because there's slightly warmer water, which is perfectly clean, but slightly warmer water going out into the ocean, and this is an environmental hazard. 
That, which is which is insanity. That's a, that's a nonsensical thing to say. I mean, I think river water coming out is colder than the Pacific Ocean too. You know, just uh, blockade the river. Um, you know, so they're going to shut that down. They're going to replace it with fossil fuels uh, or or unreliable renewables, and we'll have worse problems. And we'll probably have more heat related deaths because people will not have power and therefore not air conditioning. Um, it, it's just kind of the silliness of the solutions. Um, the, the, actually the thing I want to end on because, we, uh, we, sorry, can I just add, add one, sure. one, one small comment to that? Because it's not just, uh, if you drive up power costs, yes, it has the impact that you are going to see more heat deaths, but you're also going to see a lot more cold deaths because that's really what keep old people, especially warm in the winter. We had a great experiment, natural experiment when, when the U S did fracking, uh, back in the 2010s, you dramatically dropped the cost of gas. Then researchers looked at people who use gas to heat their homes. What they found was when the gas price dropped, people could afford to keep their homes much better heated in the winter. That means every year, because of fracking, 11,000 Americans didn't die from cold deaths because they could afford to heat their homes. If you drive up the price, you're going to see another 11,000 people die just like that. So there are real world impacts for these things. I, uh, the last thing I want to end on, because this this entire podcast has been about the premise, okay? We, we didn't talk a whole lot about the solutions, but we, we've talked about that in past podcasts, and I think people who listen to me regularly know what those are. Um, but it's important to get the premise right, because that's, that's a, it's a big part of the debate. And while, while I think a lot of Republicans have, have, have basically come around to, the, to your position, which is, look, yes, it happens, it's real, there's a cost— but now we're now we have to quibble over the extreme the extremity of that cost and 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 that is arguing the premise to an extent. One one thing. So this is the last thing I want to end with because this was a, an interesting tweet thread you had about the UN report claiming climate related disasters are, are five times what they have been, and you have this graph, which is really interesting, um, where it actually shows that all disasters whether they're technological, like a train derailing, whether they're weather-related, whether they're earthquakes or volcanoes. Starting in, like, 1980, they just all skyrocketed. Um, yeah. And it's like, it's like we had no disasters from 1900 to 1960, according to these numbers. Uh, and this gets back to your point before, in the 60s and 70s. So there's something going on, on around the 60s and 70s, but... But I, I, what it seems to me is, is it is it just the fact that we could actually measure where all of these things are happening this with is, things like the is, Internet and, and satellites? This is, and, yes, this is a documentation issue, and it's a well-known issue. So, look, the world's premier disaster database, uh, they're doing a great job there in Belgium. And, you know, it's a, a few researchers that are basically trying to d collect all disasters that ever happened in the world. Can you imagine trying to do that for the 1930s in the Congo? It's impossible. <laughs> you You'd have no you're, idea. You're only, you're only going to hear about the very, very biggest things that happen. Maybe. You're probably going to miss quite a few. But what happened in the 80s and 90s and onwards is, of course, the Internet exploded. Everything is now possible. Everything is documented. So basically what they're doing is they're finding a lot more clippings of all things that go wrong. We call things disasters that wouldn't even have been mentioned in local papers, let alone being known in Belgium, um, that this was a problem. What we're simply seeing is better documentation. So when people come out and say, ah, so global warming caused five time increase in, uh, you know, in weather related disasters. First of all, that's uh, that's just uh, hokum. Uh, but most importantly, if you really want to make that point and use bad data to uh, to to support it, you also have to uh, expect and, and assume that global warming made volcanoes five times more likely mm -hmm. or train derailings five times more likely. No, what's happening, of course, is that we have a lot more clips. And one of the reasons we know that is because when you compare it to, for instance, good U.S. data, uh, for instance, tornadoes. They hear very, very few tornadoes from the U.S. back in the 1960s. But then, you know, it gets easier and easier to read reports about dangerous tornadoes. So their database actually shows that tornadoes shoot up, I believe it's 13 times. Whereas, of course, the reality is they've reduced by 50 percent. How is that possible? Because in Belgium, they read more American newspapers from the 2000s. It's, this is not rocket science. Yeah. But it's this hokum when you come out and say, ah, global warming is causing all this. 
The last thing I just want to say is if you actually look at the only thing that's really hard to uh, to uh, fudge, which is deaths. Instead of talking about, you know, what happened, oh, there was a train railing, nobody, uh, you know, got hurt, but oh, it looked really bad in the news. Uh, if you actually look at deaths, deaths have gone down, and especially so, not so much for volcanoes and, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, earthquakes, but dramatically so for weather-related disasters. Why? Not because global warming hasn't made it been a problem, but simply because resilience has made all the difference. In 1970, we had the world's worst hurricane in Bangladesh that killed about 300,000 people, mostly because nobody knew and we didn't have prediction and there's you know, a lot of political uproar. Uh, so lots and lots of people died. Today, the same kind of hurricanes kill a couple thousand people because Bangladesh, even though they're incredibly poor, know how to do that. You have you know, centers where people act, uh, congregate, you have better information, you have uh, warning systems, all these kinds of things. The simple truth is, if you care about the future, do stuff that works instead of just doing stuff that makes you feel good. You know, Bjorn, I, I, I hope all the young people who are uh, not able to sleep at night because of climate change uh, listen to this podcast and uh, they'll, they'll get a better night's sleep. The, the world is not ending. The world is not ending and there's vast agreement um, to make the world cleaner also. So everybody can calm down. I think that's the uh, I think that's the uh, the main message here. Bjorn, thanks so much for being on, as always. Dan, great to be on here. Thank you. I really appreciate it.